Well, thank you, everybody. Um, good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody and uh, apologize for the difficulties out front in getting through security. But the one thing uh, maybe makes people feel a little better, when, when Ernie Banks got his Presidential Medal of Freedom, he also got stuck outside. And it was a question whether he'd get in. And then, back, then Kyle worked his magic again and made sure that Ernie was here to get his award. So I'm glad it worked out again today uh, for everyone. So thank you. What I'd like to do is you know, call the meeting to order and uh, thank again everyone for uh, bearing with us and being here today. Uh, my first, I'd like to introduce uh, Melissa Coity. She's the Executive Director of the Council and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Consumer Policy and Department of Treasury. Melissa will sort of lead us through uh, the dialogue, sort of be our master of ceremonies today, and uh, make sure we have quality time for terrific conversation. We really love this setting um, because it's much more congenial to a conversation and discussion from the ceremonial uh, kind of discussions we've had in the past. So we think this is really absolutely terrific. So we thank you and your team for helping bring us here, as well as our team from the White House. Kyle, thank you uh, for getting us here. It's a, it's a wonderful place. And uh, Melissa and her team have been just terrific to work with. I think all the council members know that. Uh, all the various committee chairs have had a chance to get to see that. And uh, so thank you, Melissa, and I'll turn it over to you. Super. Do you mind if I borrow your mic also? Uh, I will just say a couple things really at the start. Um, I've, we've talked to many of you around the table in your teams. We really wanted today's conversation to be truly that, a conversation. For all of you council members who have professionally, personally, really sort of stepped up to both think about, analyze, research, and act in the context of improving the financial capability. By that I mean the financial knowledge, the financial resources, the tools that young people are using to really get a good start <coughs> on their financial future. So thank you for joining us all today. And thanks for agreeing to join us and be a part of a conversation. Um, you have the agendas in front of you, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time right now talking through that. We are going to kick it off with some remarks. Um, this is clearly a large and big priority for the administration, and that is clearly uh, reflected in who we have joining us today. Um, so to start, we're going to hear from Cecilia Munoz. Thank you so much, Cecilia, for being with us. Cecilia, for those of you who aren't aware of this, is the assistant to the president and the head of the Domestic Policy Council. So thank you, Cecilia. Thanks a lot, Melissa. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, so this is indeed a priority for the president. Um, he sends his regrets that he's not able to be here himself, but as you can see by the presence of Secretary Liu, Secretary Duncan, Director Cordray, he's really sent the, the eight team, and those are these are um, members of his team that are deeply, deeply committed to the work of the council. And so I, I thank you, Melissa, I thank uh, John, the uh, chairman, for your efforts. Um, this work essentially intersects with, with all of the big stuff that we're working on. Um, and that's really what I, wanna, what I wanna convey this morning. And I'll be brief because we have important work to do. But um, you've heard the president talking about, uh, especially in the State of the Union address, but this really is infused throughout the work that he's done throughout this administration. He's trying to build an economy of the 21st century so that we lead the world in the 21st century the way we did in the 20th. And he's putting emphasis in particular on the middle class, on people fighting to get to the middle class. Um, and when you hear him talk about it, he's focusing on things like, the, you know, the things which are sort of the bedrock of the middle class, making sure you can save for your child's education, making sure a family can save for retirement. Um, uh, these are things which are vital to the well-being of individuals. They're vital to the well-being of families, communities, and to our, um, our financial well-being as a society. And um, we do a lot of policy work focusing on the tools and the mechanisms that government has to facilitate things like college savings or paying for college or affording college loans, to facilitate things like retirement savings, to facilitate things like home ownership. And the, it's important that we get the policy tools right, and we're working very hard on getting the policy tools right. And there are some very ambitious proposals on the table, and others, you know, still on the drawing board. Um, but the 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 capacity of those you know, really good policies to actually have impact on people's lives is completely dependent on people having the tools to use them and to know the mechanics, enough of the mechanics of the financial system so that you can benefit from good policies on mortgages, good policies on student loans and student debt and student and college savings, good policies with respect to retirement savings. Um, and that 
as we know, many people connect to the financial system, often getting their first bank account because they have a job which requires direct deposit. And that creates a moment in time where you have an opportunity to connect with people and sort of advance their financial education. Um, there are sort of other particular moments in time, especially early in people's careers, where we have opportunities. Um, uh, saving for college and getting to college and paying back college loans are, are, are other very important moments. So we, we do a lot of very important work to help people aspire to those things. Um, and the work that you're doing is just tremendously important to make sure that we take advantage of the opportunities that we have in the moments where we are connected to people to make sure that they uh, have a deep enough understanding of the mechanics of these um, dynamics that they're going to encounter to be able to make the most use of what we are trying to make available to folks. Um, so um, we're, this is a very high quality group. We're really grateful for the hard work that you've all put into this. Um, we're very eager to be, to be part of the work going forward um, and to hear what you have to say and to make sure that we're really maximizing the ways in which the administration is learning from and building on what you put together. So thank you all very, very much and uh, I look forward to the discussion today. Great, thank you, Cecilia. Secretary Liu, would you like to make some remarks? Thank you, uh, Melissa, and uh, thank you to John Rogers and uh, Melissa for the work that you do around the year to keep the work of this group going. And I hope that today's meeting gives us a chance to start to pull some of those things together and push them forward from discussions into actions that we can all, all take. I think the reason that we're all here at this table is a shared understanding that in many ways opportunity really begins with financial literacy. Uh, the decisions you make uh, from a very early age when you go to college, you know, most people don't think of that as being a big financial decision that they make in life. It's a huge financial decision, and so many people don't understand as well as they should what the financial ramifications of their choices are. Uh, going through life, the more you've learned uh, from the beginning uh, about financial choices and what the consequences and meaning of those choices are, the more likely you are to have the ability to build both a personal uh, credit history that gives you the ability to participate fully in the economy and to make the kinds of decisions that make you able to empower yourself. Uh, I look around this table and I see people from you know, federal, state, and local government, from the world of finance, from education. And I think this is really the kind of conversation that is required for us to make sure that we make the decisions and put in place the policies where we give people the tools, young people in particular, the tools uh, to get started uh, making the kinds of decisions that will lead to a strong foundation for their own future. Um, now, it's important for them as individuals, but it's also important for us as an economy because each of these individuals cumulatively make up the economic future of our country. So their success and the good decisions that they make have everything to do with the economic future that we have as a nation. I want to just talk for a minute about something we're doing at Treasury that we think is very much allied with the efforts here, and that is focusing in retirement security on a program we're calling MyRA. Um, MyRA is a new program. It's kind of a savings bond kind of program where there's zero risk, the ability to put in very small amounts of money, the ability to get access if you need it, to get people over that hurdle of getting started, saving for retirement. Um, we don't believe that relatively small accounts are enough for people to retire in security, but we do believe that getting people started into the habit, even if it's 5 and $10 a pay period, will get them to the place where ultimately they have the kinds of 401ks and IRAs that will give them uh, the future that most people would like to have but don't have a clue to have. We think we put a product together working with uh, initially a group of employers to market it uh, through the workplace, but ultimately to open it up and have it be something that's available to people uh, much more widely. And since we're now in uh, our second year with the program, we're hoping that this is a year when we can see the program really uh, kick off in a serious way. Um, you know, there's a number of people around this table from uh, our state and local government uh, communities. Uh, an awful lot of the work that we have ahead of us is work that we need to do at the grassroots level. It's not going to be a Washington-driven uh, program. And I think it's really a positive step that we have uh, the involvement uh, you know, of, of, of so many around the country. And what I hope we can use uh, today's uh, discussion to do 
is to take a number of the ideas that have been uh, presented and talked about and really have the kind of conversation about what can we do going forward uh, to have actions uh, that really each of the participants around this table have the ability to do in their own uh, world and their own uh, activities uh, as much as we do collectively as a group. So again, thank you, John, uh, for your leadership and Melissa for yours. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. I hope we do, by the way, I'm just going to put a pin in this, really talk about the MyRA option and opportunity. It is, uh, it is, I can't help but call this out to start this conversation at some point today. Um, we know that there is a need for access to safe and affordable products, whether it's a transaction product or a savings product. We at Treasury have been working to build really what is a very safe and affordable uh, product with a MyRA account, and it's a really great opportunity for you all in your in your work in your communities to really bring that product to individuals there. So just to put a pin in it, hope we get to talk about it. Um, Arnie, would you like to say a few things? I'll be very brief. Thank you so much. And maybe I'll start where Jack started, just on the higher education side. And what he said was exactly right. Everyone here knows that that's the best investment that young people can make in their futures and in their families' futures. Um, at the same time. Uh, the amount of debt that's out there. It's uh, north of a trillion dollars. Those numbers are hard for me to comprehend. Those are your realm. And, uh, <laughs> so while it is a, the best investment by any measure that you can make, finding ways to reduce that debt, to make it more manageable, I think we have a huge obligation. I worry about the impact of that trillion, uh, north of a trillion dollars on young people starting their own business or buying a home or whatever they're trying to do individually and the, and the impact that has on the nation's economy. So a couple buckets of work we are working on, and again, any thoughts or advice or feedback of how we can be better at this, would love to hear it. There's one bucket of work just around better information and transparency and really trying to empower young people and families to make good decisions. So I have a chance to say thanks. Treasury's been an amazing partner, Jack, you and your team, uh, with, uh, with Intuit and TurboTax and getting lots of information out about income-based plans uh, to the general public. That's been a huge step in the right direction. Rich and his team have been phenomenal in making sure that loan servicers are doing a good, honest job, and where we have bad actors uh, doing the you know doing the right thing by the public, by our customers, and uh, they've just been an extraordinary uh, source of support and a great, great thought partner. Um, making sure student loan counseling is impactful and the young people understand what they're doing. We're trying to get much, much better at that. And then there's a bucket of work I sort of put in the uh, the innovation basket. So we're doing experimental sites, what we call X sites, with universities thinking about competency-based programs and less seat time and more. If you have the knowledge, if you can demonstrate your skills, you move on. Anything we can do to speed time to completion, we think reduces expenses, reduces dropout rates, and we're starting to play with some really interesting players uh, there. Um, harder things in that space, uh, working on a college rating system, which is uh, easy to talk about. We're really trying to work through the details, but again, how we get better information around value to young people and their families and have lots of public feedback and comment there. And then ultimately, the President's put out a plan that you guys heard in the State of the Union of trying to make uh, community college free. And while that is difficult to do with a Congress that's in a, you know, not a most functional uh, position it's ever been, um, but for me, it's sort of this larger idea of thinking not about K-12 education, which has worked pretty well for the past 100 years, to really thinking about pre-K at the young end through 14. And what worked in the past was fine, but I think it's frankly insufficient today. So we want to continue to challenge the status quo. We want to continue to support innovation. We want to continue to empower young people and their families to have better information so they can make better choices. We want to drive change, be a catalyst for innovation in the marketplace. But any thoughts and feedback you have so that we can reduce that debt burden uh, for families that are working so hard to chase that middle, middle, uh, middle class dream of going to college and being able to get a high, high wage, high skilled job, um, we want to be a better partner. So appreciate the feedback. Again, John, thanks so much for your leadership. Thank you, Arnie. Uh, Rich Cordray? Yeah. Thank you, and I, and I want to essentially kind of reinforce and support uh, what Secretary Duncan said and the partnership that we've forged, marvelous partnership with the Department of Education and, and Treasury uh, on issues around uh, young people as they move into adulthood and they face the problem of, of attaining uh, higher education. 
uh, both attaining it and accomplishing it and also financially affording it. So we know that earning a college degree has become increasingly important to personal and professional success in life, no, mo no more so than ever before than at this moment. Uh, in, our, in our nation's history. But we also have seen, and, and the, Treasury the Treasury Secretary and the Education Secretary well said, student debt uh, is something that is imposing a long-term burden many people are struggling to manage. It's topped a trillion dollars. It is the second largest source of debt in our society behind mortgages. Before taking out loans to finance their education, young people must be better equipped to make smart decisions about managing college costs. Let me talk about some of the work we're doing at the Department of Education uh, in particular. Uh, We've been working to help students and families make better choices about financing higher education. We partnered with the Department of Education to create a financial aid shopping sheet, which is now being used by more than 2,000 colleges due in part to their determined uh, advocacy. The shopping sheet is a model financial aid offer letter. It's a simple document that provides students and their families with a personalized depiction of the total cost they will incur if they decide to attend that particular school. It clearly explains the differences between grants and loans. It provides information about graduation rates and default rates. Uh, this is good data uh, up to the up to the date data. The information enables families to make apples to apples comparisons between financial aid offers at different schools before making this key financial decision. We recently talked about uh, work we're doing around owning a home, and we talked a lot about how people shop hard to determine a particular house to buy, but do not shop hard around the mortgage and the financial decision. The same is true with financial education. People fall in love with the school and don't bother to compare the costs carefully of what their alternatives are. That's something we're working to uh, give people tools to correct. Building on that work, we released Paying for College, which is a suite of web tools designed to help young people and their families assess the costs and risks of financing their education in terms that are straightforward, easy to understand, and walk them through the entire process. The tools also help answer important questions such as, what will be my monthly debt payment at graduation? What are my rights or options for repaying these loans over time? And as the Secretary said, the income-based repayment is something that we're trying to promote uh, aggressively around the country. For many students, it's the right answer. The trouble is a lot of them have not known about it or understood uh, where their interests lay there. So this guidance will help people manage these issues more effectively. We also know the costs of higher education are not limited just to student loans. Another important issue for young people is how best to manage their money while they're still in school and laying down habits for their lifetime. This may be the first time they've managed money on their own. I know that was true in my case. I think it's true for many young people. There are also very attractive prospects for financial providers seeking new customers. So how students manage their money while they're still in school can have a lasting impact on their financial well-being. As public funding for higher education has been cut, some schools have found new sources of revenue in partnerships with financial institutions. That's fine as it goes. Uh, colleges have made deals to promote credit, debit, or prepaid cards in exchange for part of the revenue. Products are sometimes endorsed with the college logo or linked to a student ID card, and the financial institutions may get exclusive access to a new group of potential customers. What we're working on is making sure colleges and universities partner responsibly with financial institutions that offer checking and prepaid accounts, and we believe they should help students get the best deal. So we recently released a model safe student account scorecard designed to assist colleges in seeking accurate information about fees, features, and sales tactics from financial institutions before they enter into sponsorship arrangements. We've asked for feedback on the scorecard from the public, including students, colleges, and financial institutions to help us improve it. Many colleges have already come to us looking for advice on how to ensure campus banking products are safe for their students. Colleges and students both win when schools use their partnerships to help students succeed, not leave them bogged down with hidden fees and unwelcome surprises. We also at the Consumer Bureau are accepting complaints from students who run into problems with student loans and other financial products and services such as credit cards, debit cards, prepaid cards, and auto loans. We encourage students who believe they've been mistreated and all other consumers for that matter to visit our website at consumerfinance.gov to submit a complaint. So far we've received over 540,000 complaints on consumer financial products from people all over the country. They've led to a great deal of monetary and other relief and we also consider them carefully to inform our work to identify and root out bad actors in the financial marketplace. Turning to the subject for today, last year the Bureau engaged in pilot projects with four cities around the country to improve the financial capability of youth who are participating in summer employment programs. We found many programs that train and employ youth recognize the need to help them develop financial skills, but too often they lack the time, expertise, or resources to do so effectively. 
We're collaborating with several communities to pilot new tools to address these issues. I look forward to hearing from the panel of speakers who will discuss the role of cities and communities in improving the financial education of young Americans. This is very important work uh, and important that it be done well. Our goal is to give young people the confidence and peace of mind that the financial world they enter as they leave high school is not full of pitfalls where one bad step will ruin their lives. I believe the work being done by the Consumer Bureau and by the President's Council will help to strengthen this feeling, and we're always pleased to learn from you and work with you to ensure that every young American can gain the, no can gain the knowledge, skills, and resources to build a healthy financial future. Appreciate very much uh, being involved with this tremendous group. Well, thank you, Director Cordray. We really had a, appreciate the chance to get to know you and to work with you and your team. Uh, you've been terrific on these issues, and I know you've worked closely with Secretary Duncan, and we've had a great relationship with the Department of Education also. Yeah. And um, can't help but just uh, also, again, Secretary Liu mentioned that uh, Amayas and Louisa and Melissa have been just wonderful in your team to work with, and it's just been great. Um, and then Cecilia, it's been uh, great for you to be here and to work with you all these years. and to take the time for all of you to be here to support our group. We really want to thank you for that. Uh, now it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce and welcome a new member to our group, uh, Michael Corbett, who is the CEO of Citigroup. Uh, this is his first meeting, and so thank you for being here. And I understand you have a few remarks uh, you're going to share with us. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Rogers. Uh, we at Citi believe working in partnership with government entities and community-based organizations is not only critical to reaching young people, but very importantly, reaching young people at scale. We're also proud to direct, to support directly this, the Council's goals and share the learnings from the communities we serve, ranging from our partnership in the Innovative Kindergarten to College Savings Program in San Francisco with Treasurer Cisneros to our foundation's $50 million Pathways to Progress initiative, which is focused around the financial management aspects of 21st century skills. The city is fully committed to the Council's efforts and to doing all we can to support the Council in its initiatives, and it's an honor to serve on the Council. It's great to be here today, and I look forward to a, to a fun dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad you're here, too. Uh, so now, uh, without further ado, we want to begin the conversation among all of you council members. Um, as you've heard, there's a theme that's uh, really sort of, uh, I think, council members and their efforts are coalescing around, and that is recognition of the really central role uh, that cities and communities play in terms of touch points with young people in building their financial access, their financial capability, their financial skills. Uh, there are a number of endeavors that many of you were involved in that are really leveraging the city community connection. And we're gonna have now a very focused conversation about the roles of cities and communities that's going to be uh, kicked off and led by uh, my boss, Maya Garrity, who is our counselor to the Treasury Secretary. And to, to get the conversation started, we're going to hear from three individuals who are essentially <coughs> practitioners, if you will, who are uh, leading city and community efforts. We're going to hear from our vice chair, Jose Cisneros. We're going to hear from Kurt Summers, who is the treasurer. Where are you, Kurt? There you are. Uh, who is a treasurer in Chicago, uh, newly minted as a treasurer in Chicago. And we're going to hear from Brandy McHale, who's head of City Foundation, who's been doing a lot of work. And I've known her for many, many years. And she's done amazing work, really bringing resources to bear and big ideas to bear, really in the vein of trying to build scale um, to really touch um, millions of young people. So I'm going to turn it over to Amayas to get us going. And then we'll start the flow of the conversation. Great. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to highlight what I see as some really powerful ideas that are coming out of the working groups and coming out of the work that uh, people are doing around this table. We'll hear this morning about cities. And I think we all know about the role that cities play, their convening authority, their power as communities and integrated communities between uh, youth, education, uh, and workforce. Uh, we've heard already and we'll hear more about the role that cities can play in workforce training. And we'll also hear about efforts to combine that with financial education and financial products. And lastly, I think one of the really powerful ideas that's come out of a number of the conversations with people around this table is how to connect that um, role that cities are already playing today with notions of entrepreneurship, 
apprenticeship and mentorship and really drawing young people not just into workforce training programs, but really into the workforce itself. And so I think that's a really powerful idea that's come out of these conversations and I look forward to hearing uh, the conversation from these practitioners, but also from the group about how we can build that into a reality. All right. Here we go. Uh, so good morning. I wanted to first say thank you to uh, the chairman, John Rogers, for the opportunity to address the council this morning and for your leadership over decades on this issue. Um, uh, and also to, to Vice Chairman Cisneros for helping me as a new treasurer uh, get up to speed and uh, uh, visiting with us in Chicago and, and sort of laying the groundwork uh, and certainly to uh, my friend that uh, the uh, Secretary of Education Ernie Duncan for for your uh, constant uh, support and and presence uh, were needed um, I want to just sort of take a moment to describe the the pro the problem statement if you will uh, that we're trying to solve for in Chicago uh, and and very simply it is that uh, too many Chicagoans, and particularly young Chicagoans, lack the financial skills to manage their finances effectively. And as a result, um, too often uh, incur more expensive debt, uh, miss opportunities for greater savings opportunities, and, uh, and certainly uh, are not exposed to opportunities to create wealth and build assets. Uh, what we've uh, what we've learned as a result of uh, this problem and what we should sort of try to do to address it um, is we started by creating an inventory of all of the players in Chicago who address this today. So Amias talked about the, the convening authority. Well, there's a, there's a great need for that. Uh, our inventory uh, tells us that there are 135 different organizations in Chicago uh, that focus on financial education in some fashion. They're all doing so uh, in different ways, with different purposes, different curriculum, uh, reaching different target audiences, uh, and are, are in uh, very few ways coordinated. Um, uh, so it became very clear to us what the um, solution should be or what the framework for a solution to this problem would be given that the vision is uh, to make it such that all Chicago students and families should have the capability to make informed personal financial decisions that lead to future financial empowerment. So how do we make this happen? Um, uh, you've been provided a document uh, which shows a financial education network which we are uh, putting together in Chicago uh, and launching in partnership uh, with Mayor Emanuel, uh, the Chicago Public Schools, Chicago Public Library, Department of Family and Support Services, uh, and the city colleges, the community colleges of Chicago, all working in unison uh, with the collection of all of the nonprofit agencies and organizations who touch this topic today. Um, in our ability to convene all of these stakeholders, what we've learned is there's, there's tremendous value um, to have the level of transparency that this will provide uh, in terms of the objectives of uh, the administration, both uh, the mayor's office, my office, uh, and uh, Chicago Public Schools, but also uh, transparency for the uh, foundations and the funding community uh, and having line of sight for how their dollar is going to its highest and best use. Um, it's being most efficient uh, in, it, in its deployment um, and, and there will be common uh, metrics for measurement across the entire system in a way that is consistent with what the priorities of uh, the leaders um, in education and in the city uh, have laid out. We believe that this uh, sort of first of its kind effort um, will break new ground, not only in um, efficiency, but also in innovation. And as I listen to Secretary Duncan uh, and Director Cordray point on the issue of needing to innovate here, it's only through that level of cooperation and a set of incentives uh, financially 
uh, that can be created where, where that sort of innovation uh, can be fostered. This plan is off to a great start in Chicago with three uh, major successes to speak of already. Uh, the first is it's led to uh, a collaborative effort uh, led by the Chicago Public Schools to redefine its K through 12 financial education guide. Um, and, and that effort has, has truly been um, um, a marvel to watch because it's required the coordination of all of these parties who clearly have a strong opinion on what the curriculum should be. Uh, and we've been able to coordinate that and the Chicago Public Schools has taken the lead in revamping their, um, uh, their uh, uh, guide. Um, secondly, we're coordinating resources this summer to provide incremental uh, uh, professional development to teachers, uh, which we know will be key as, as, we talk, as we think about how this ties to Common Core. Uh, um, teachers need the resources to uh, be able to connect this material to their students and in their classrooms. Um, we are marshalling those resources collectively uh, and providing uh, them as needed beginning this summer, which I think is a, a great first step. And then finally, uh, the, my office and the Chicago Public Library uh, have combined to uh, uh, roll out a, a new program making financial ed education more accessible in the library system uh, through a grant that was awarded by FINRA and the American Library Association. These resources are going to be targeted to neighborhoods with high concentrations of un or underbanked households and, and new Americans. Uh, and we believe that leveraging the library network in this way and providing the resources of my office uh, in support will allow us to reach an entire new population of people that we're not reaching today. Um, so, you know, that's sort of the, the quick update on what's happening in Chicago. And I understand also from Louisa that uh, the document was provided uh, will also be emailed to you and available on the, on the website. Good morning. On behalf of City, we appreciate the opportunity to appear before members of the council. Um, city has a long track record, as was noticed, noted in the introduction, of working in cities and communities around the world to improve the financial capabilities of young people. And we're proud to be one of the largest philanthropic investors in related research and innov innovation testing across the United States. This has been a journey, and there have been many lessons learned along the way. And we want to commend the Council for its commitment to showcasing and promoting new ideas and providing a forum for stakeholders to learn from one another. But we're particularly appreciative and mindful of the Council's guidance and commitment to us to avoid reinventing the wheel and instead promote collaborations that bring our collective work to the next level of success. Through this open and frank dialogue over the past year and our specific engagement in the cities and communities working group, um, the City Foundation has been focusing on two key challenges. The first is to develop cost-effective delivery channels that are key to reaching scale. And the second is identifying teachable moments where we can best reach young people and support them to establish lifelong positive financial behaviors. Um, last year, soon after the council convened, as Mike noted, the City Foundation launched Pathways to Progress, a three-year commitment to connect 100,000 low-income youth across 10 cities with the skills and leadership experience, including entrepreneurship and mentorship, that are critical to competing in the 21st century job market. A core pillar of this effort is supporting young people to gain work experience through summer jobs. Every summer, cities and communities across America employ hundreds of thousands of young people, either directly in city agencies or through partnerships and placements with the nonprofit and private sector. And our goal and our challenge was to say, how can we leverage this existing system creatively? And together with our partners, the City for Financial Empowerment Fund, we piloted Summer Jobs Connect, sponsoring employment slots for young people age 14 to 24. Now, we know that these jobs are an opportunity to build skills, and we're excited because we also know that they're important on-ramps to the world of work. But we think summer youth employment programs are unique for another reason as well. 
They're not just a few weeks in the lives of a young person in the summer. It's not just a moment in time. But actually, these summer jobs can be a defining moment in a young person's life. Further, they represent a prime teachable moment and an opportunity to build financial capability. I'm always amazed when we talk about this program, if we were to go around the table, um, all of you can actually recall your first job. No matter what it was, how glamorous or potentially unglamorous, which is more likely the case, um, it's an experience that sticks with people. And so our program not only provides funding to underwrite these jobs, but um, it also provides innovation funding directly to cities to integrate financial education into this employment experience. From enrolling young people into direct deposit on day one as part of their job orientation process, to encouraging young people to save um, every week that they get their, their pay and sending them text message reminders, encouraging them to stay on track and stick with their plan, to actually um, making connections for young people in these summer youth employment programs directly to existing financial coaches that are trusted advisors in their local communities so they can have those discussions about planning for college, paying for college, and gaining those skills they need for success. Simply put, the, the fundamental idea behind this effort is that a first job is a first paycheck. And we think it's the first opportunity to gain a foothold in the financial mainstream. This is an important model that builds off of existing municipal delivery systems to reach people. We're not creating something from scratch. We're not, as the council has reminded us, reinventing the wheel. And we also think it's important to note that the program doesn't help young people directly, but it's a critical way that we're helping cities to deal with the real um, social and financial cost of youth unemployment and deliver financial education at a time in a person's life when it's incredibly relevant and meaningful to them. So 2014, we started, and this was a learning year. It was a pilot year. And we had a chance to support several cities and track how their programs work, what are the challenges and opportunities. And we have today, um, the uh, white paper that chronicles our first year experience. You all have a copy and there are electronic copies available for distribution as well. But in the interest of time, um, I'll just give you the main headline. Municipal summer youth employment programs are a high impact and cost effective way to reach people and build their financial awareness and capabilities. So if 2014 was a learning year, what's 2015? 2015 is our scaling and innovation year. And in support of the council's objective to not just foster dialogue, but to move that dialogue to action, I'm pleased to be seated next to our partner, Jonathan Mintz from the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund, and to have you be the first to know that we are announcing today uh, um, an investment of $4.6 million to expand this program from five to seven cities this summer. The cities will include Washington, D.C., St. Louis, Chicago, Los Angeles, Miami, New York, and San Francisco. And we're going to work with each city not just to provide dollars, but to support them to directly to innovate and to serve as a model for other cities and communities across the country that are working to prepare the next generation for economic progress and success in a cost-effective and re results-driven manner. So on behalf of City and our partners at the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund, we look forward to sharing our experiences with you and to continuing our partnership. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, hello, I'm honored to be serving as the Vice Chair of this Council and to be chairing the Cities and Communities Working Group. This council allows us to not only highlight the best practices we see across the country, but to combine our unique powers and skills as federal agencies, financial institutions, and community leaders to remove barriers, to create the best financial products, to enhance programmatic delivery systems, and to protect consumers in the marketplace. As we've already heard from the powerful comments this morning, and particularly from some of my colleagues working with municipal government, it clearly demonstrates that cities and communities are where much of this work really happens. 
Through local government leadership, we've seen programs like Bank on San Francisco spread to more than 100 cities in the United States and shine a spotlight on what local governments can and should be doing to increase financial security for our residents. And we've done so much more since then. One thing we've done to further leverage the tremendous power of city government and to help every young person save for their future is that in 2011, San Francisco launched kindergarten to college and became the first city in the United States to automatically enroll every incoming kindergartner in a college savings account. And that's a savings account easily accessible at our local Citibank branches. Our savings participation rates are now, just a few years later, four times higher than the rates of American families saving in 529 accounts. And through k to c our families have saved over $1 million of their own money for their children's college educations. This number is even more remarkable when you consider that one in two of our k to c savers are from low-income families enrolled in the National School Lunch Program. We know that local government leadership works, and we're committed to working in partnership with the Cities for Financial Empowerment Fund and with municipal leaders across the United States to do even more to improve the financial security and well-being of Americans. Projects like Summer Jobs Connect are a powerful example of how American cities, including San Francisco, can bring together public, private, and nonprofit partners to effectively leverage an important federally supported program. As we heard, a first job is a critical moment in a young person's life that represents a first opportunity to open a checking account and enter the financial mainstream to learn money management skills that will guide them through their lifetime and to establish a habit of saving from every paycheck. We need to use this opportunity to its fullest potential and ensure every young person participating in a youth employment and training program can start their working life on a path to financial stability. In our city this summer, we're, we are pledged to connect 7,000 young people in our summer jobs program to checking accounts and financial education and provide 2,000 matched savings accounts to help save a habit of saving from their very first paycheck. The eight cities that will spearhead this work in 2015 are making tremendous advances in financial capability for young people. But you know what? We can't do this alone. I'm asking the President's Council to join us to make sure that embedding financial capability practices into youth training and employment programs becomes standard practice across the United States. This is a tangible and practical commitment we can make together. We can get this done, and we must. We must work closely with, financial, with federal agencies to ensure funds that support youth training and employment programs can be directed towards financial education purposes. We must partner with financial institutions to develop and disseminate the best checking and saving products for our young people and work with our regulators to ensure that working youth, even under the age of 18, have a safe and affordable way to access their wages. We must combine best financial education resources with the opportunities afforded by technology to connect young people with meaningful financial education that can be accessed in ways that are effective, efficient, and even fun. And we must work together to integrate the learnings and best practices into every youth employment program in the United States to make sure that no young person ever again takes their first paycheck to a check casher. I'm proud to say that San Francisco is on track to become one of the most financially empowered cities in the country. Cities possess a tremendous array of tools and opportunities. We regulate, we enforce, and we fund and implement public programming. By working closely with federal government, the private sector, and our nonprofit partners, I know that the cities and communities across the country can continue to leverage our strengths to build a wealthier and more successful future for everyone in America. Thank you. Thank you. So I think it'd be great just to open it up for conversation. I know these ideas have resonated not just with the folks who've spoken today, but with mem many other members of the council. So I'll just open it up and ask for people to jump in. Myas, can I start with a question, Please. maybe? Um, 
This is a very, these presentations about the summer uh, coordination of jobs and financial education are both exciting and seem to have great potential. We have a lot of participants around the table from the financial services industry. Um, it would seem like a natural uh, partnership to not just have public jobs, but to have you know, financial planners and financial institutions who are hiring people for summer jobs to be doing the same thing, direct mentoring, and to share best practices, because obviously uh, if you're in a financial institution, you'll have more natural access to getting accounts set up. But to see, to, instead of having them just be kind of off on their own, is there any way to bring this together where we can see a future of more mentorship and uh, opportunity in financial institutions and this crossover in financial education uh, more organically? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, thank you um, and good morning. Um, I'm Bob Glovsky, and I'd like to describe, if I may, two initiatives uh, through the Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards. Uh, I've been a practicing financial planner and uh, past director of the Boston University Program for Financial Planners for over 20 years, and I was the 2010 CFP Board Chair. Uh, just by way of background to um, address your question, C a CFP Board is a 501c3 nonprofit standard-setting organization for the financial planning profession, which was founded in 1985. Its mission is to benefit the public by granting the CFP certification and upholding it as the recognized standard of excellence for financial planning. CFP certification is recognized as the highest standard in financial planning. It identifies financial planners who have met the CFP board's rigorous examination, education, and experience standards. CFP professionals advise individuals and families on a broad range of financial topics, including household budgeting, retirement, taxes, investments, insurance, and many others. So I think that helps to set the page. And they provide financial planning services under a fiduciary standard of care, putting the client's best interest first, similar to President Obama's announcement last week. Today, the CFP Board approved financial planning curriculum is offered at 228 colleges and universities nationwide, including 128 baccalaureate degree programs, 50 master's degree programs, five doctorate programs. Of these 228 programs, 11 are hit at historically black colleges and universities, and 14 are with Hispanic-serving institutions. CFP Board oversees 71,000 CFP professionals in the U.S., the largest country share of the 157,000 professionals worldwide. And today you'll find CFP professionals working in investment banks, insurance companies, commercial banks, mutual fund companies, and as independent registered investment advisors. The first initiative is focused on increasing the financial capability of young Americans as they enter the workforce by providing pro bono, fiduciary level, financial planning advice from certified financial planner professionals. In regards to providing this advice to students, CFP Board has a long-standing record of facilitating pro bono initiatives, including being a national partner with Jumpstart Coalition and delivering free financial planning clinics to K-12 teachers, organizing five years of pro bono financial planning days that deliver one-on-one -on -one pro bono financial planning to public in dozens of cities nationwide, partnering with AARP on nearly 100 events each year to deliver pro bono financial planning to older Americans, and working with the Departments of Labor and Justice to deliver financial planning tools for consumers and provide pro bono assistance to victims of financial fraud. With over 71,000 trained volunteers, the CFP Board can partner with schools and municipalities nationwide to provide free advice to assist our young citizens to become more financially capable. The second initiative I'd like to describe is the Workforce Development Initiative, because I think this ties together. And it's focused on educating students about rewarding career opportunities in financial services, including several internship pro opportunities. A 2013 study noted that advisor numbers will continue to slide over the next five years as the advisor population ages. At the same time, there's 27% forecasted job growth for personal financial advisors through 2022 compared to a national average of 11% for all occupations. But today there are more CFP professionals over 70 than under 30 years of age, and only 23% are women. In addition, Financial Planning Magazine published the following statistics. African Americans comprise 6.1% of the profession versus 12.2% of the population, while Hispanics are 6% versus 15.7% of the population. Much of this shortage can be traced to a lack of awareness, misconceptions, and industry environment. 
This is why the CFP board is initiating the Center for Financial Planning, a broad initiative to bring financial service firms, educators, and practitioners together to address workforce development challenges for the financial planning profession to better serve the American people in the 21st century. The mission of the center, in part, is to, quote, build capacity for the financial planning profession by creating a sustainable supply of new and more diverse advisors to replace the retiring workforce, end quote. The center will serve as a catalyst to conduct research-based initiatives to attract and develop diverse next generation of financial planners. These planners will better reflect the population in general and therefore creates outstanding long-term career opportunities for today's youth. The center's initiative and goals work best when this not-for-profit combines with others. The talent shortage affects all of us in America. Consequently, the CFP board wants to partner, wants the center to partner with government, business, academia, foundations, and practitioners, the theme of this meeting today. So I really do want to conclude by saying together, we can do it, and thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mark? Let me, uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, to everyone, and thank you, Secretary Lou, Director Cordray, and I see. Uh, and, and I want to, what city is doing is the exact approach that works because it's not a wheel reinvention. It's not an effort to create uh, a new curriculum, a new program. It's an effort to embed financial education in something that's worked for 50 years, and that is summer youth employment. And so it's an approach, and I applaud the approach. And, and I want to highlight, because I think it's complementary to this, the way we, as a direct services organization that works through 95 affiliates across the nation. So I just listed, this is all in the last few years, we've taken our after school program, which is about college readiness and we've embedded a, an aspect of financial education into it, and that is preparing and socializing and enabling young people to fill out the FASB form and to understand the availability of scholarships, grants, and how you go and get them. We've taken, and, and I don't want this point to be mixed, missed, there's a big commitment in the government today to financial education. It's called the Housing Counseling Program. It's funded through HUD. Uh, because HUD has funded it consistently for now uh, 40 or so years, it has enabled organizations like ours to go out to the private sector and the foundation sector and draw in additional money for the exact same initiative. It's not a wheel reinvention. We've taken our Seniors in Community Services program, which is funded, it's not about young Americans, which is funded also through the Department of Labor, and we've added a financial capability or financial education component to an existing program. So, Mr. Secretary, the role of the private sector and the financial services sector can be value add through its philanthropic work to what in fact works at the local community level, at the national intermediary level. The idea is how to get it done quickly without imagining that we've got this blank sheet of paper. Uh, no, we don't have a blank sheet of paper. What we have is an existing patchwork of curriculum and initiatives, and around this table and with the president and this council, tremendous will. I want to just make this final point, because I think this is important. Why are we here and what is this about? There's momentum, motivation behind this issue, I think, because of what the nation went through called the Great Recession. And there's a lingering sense that the Great Recession was caused by things that you've devoted tremendous effort to, and that is tightening the rules of the road. But the other side of it is, were people equipped to make the right decisions in an increasingly complex financial system. And I think what this is about is helping to answer that question by starting very, very early. So uh, I appreciate sort of your perspective, but I really believe that 
uh, in invitation to the financial services industry and every private sector, and thank you to Citi, it is about adding to what already exists. The Summer Youth Employment Program is a great opportunity. My final, final point is, right now, there is a brand new job training initiative called the Workforce Investment Opportunity Act. That act requires that 75% of the money that's going to be invested be invested in disconnected youth. So within the implementation of that, there needs to be a conversation and a discussion about how the work of this commission, the work of uh, financial education can be embedded and made a component of what is going to really be a new rollout of how we invest in disconnected youth. So I think uh, integration, tying things together is what our charge is. Thank you. Amias? That's great. And I, I think one of the things we've been working very actively on uh, with labor through the Financial Literacy and Education Council, we actually, not just this past meeting, but the meeting before, spent a number of uh, part of that agenda talking about the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act. And we've been working with them to embed notions of financial literacy into the broader concepts of workforce training. So I think this is a really important example and one that I'd encourage people to get engaged with um, as it gets implemented. And then one of the things you and I have talked about is this idea that you know, IBM has had this program where, in terms of STEM, getting young people opportunities to develop careers in you know, science and technology, and this idea of trying to create careers for uh, young people, especially from disadvantaged communities in the financial services world, we think is an equally powerful idea. And if you think about it, those young people then become sort of pied pipers for all their relatives, all their friends to become more and more financially sophisticated and prepared for all these challenges. So I think it's all part of that that story. Okay. Any? One of the other things that I think we uh, wanted to recognize, Sherry Black, you have done a research uh, recently about um, some of the challenges in tribal communities, and I, I thought maybe it would be helpful to talk a little bit in particular about uh, financial products and the access to financial products and where the gaps are uh, for youth in those, in those communities. Um, thank you. Um, yes, there are definitely limits on access to financial products, but one of the things that um, I wanted to address was the reasons I came on the Cities and Communities um, Task Force or Working Group was because really raising the unique role of tribal governments um, in this. So wherever you hear cities that we've talked about, if you would put tribal governments in there, the same things are, are holding true. And, and there have been um, some recent reports that are taking a look at what all tribal governments are in fact doing to increase financial capability, some of which is, is looking at different kinds of products um, that they can offer through um, alternative financial institutions there, um, through the, some of the summer employment programs that tribes uh, offer as well, um, and most of the 566 tribes have summer youth employment, and they're offering um, not only financial education, but access to savings products, um, that they're doing savings accounts, um, whether they be you know, um, CSAs or just your basic kind of savings account. So having that, um, just having the financial education, I think, um, is key, but it really does need to be linked with the, the use of products and access to different kinds of products. And I think tribes are really breaking new ground in this, in this area. So thank you. And I know also, John Hope, Brian, you've been talking to us a little bit about how to build this and the ability to build this idea into many other uh, networks. So I thought maybe you wanted to offer some thoughts about that. Uh, sure. Um, thank you all uh, for your leadership. I, I want to first, before I say anything else, uh, acknowledge that uh, it's fortuitous we're meeting on March 3rd, um, 150 years ago today. Abraham Lincoln, not very far from where we're sitting, signed a piece of legislation called the Freedmen's Bureau Act. The Freedmen's Bureau Act created the Freedmen's Bank, the Freedmen's Bank's mission to teach free slaves about money. Can't make this up. 
coincidence, uh, Ambassador Young would say, coincidence God way of staying anonymous. Uh, so at the Treasury Annex, which is a, a stone's throw away, Frederick Douglass, who ran the bank for Abraham Lincoln after he was assassinated, um, uh, put $10,000 of his own money up to keep the bank going after the assassination. And when it failed, he said, the failure of this bank did more to set free slaves back than 10 more years of slavery. And this work, of course, is yet to be done. Uh, so I think it's interesting and fortuitous that we're meeting on March 3rd, uh, 150 years later, uh, to uh, continue uh, uh, this work um, of uh, helping to give people liberty and freedom of all races. Um, I've been inspired, uh, we'll be at the National Archives this afternoon for those who are interested to celebrate that formally. I've been inspired by what uh, Chairman John Rogers was talking about um, uh, late last year around internships, and uh, he mentioned a little bit about it today. I've been inspired by what Jose uh, Cisneros has been doing in uh, San Francisco, not just in San Francisco, uh, modeled by his work there, but really in inspiring people around the country, other leaders now uh, in, Ch in Chicago and other places, um, around a collaborative m model um, around your first, your first account and tying that into savings and so on and so forth. And Ted Beck has got a long history in this space. I've been looking and listening at a lot of things going on. This committee that Visa has been led, has been very impressive, uh, Charlotte. And uh, one thing I thought would be uh, maybe helpful was a catalytic um, kick, a support base uh, to help people between meetings to move this agenda along. I mean, people have good intentions. They go to these meetings and they mean well and they have a lot of passion and a lot of interest. And then, then, then reality rushes uh, back into your life after the meeting is over and you're overwhelmed with uh, details and Six weeks pass, and you find yourself at another meeting and wondering what progress has been made. So uh, I don't know who has it. I think somebody has. Uh, we have a commitment today from the, a $2 billion foundation. Some of you know the Casey Family Programs, uh, a legacy of Jim Casey, the uh, founder of UPS. Uh, but we got a, a, a kind gift uh, from uh, Dr. William Bell, the CEO of the Casey Family Foundation, to endow a dedicated fellow to support Chairman Rogers. Uh, he can sit or she can sit wherever you like. She can, he or she can sit at Treasury. He or she can sit at John Rogers' office uh, or wherever. Uh, 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 <laughs> but, this, but this person will, this person will give council members 20 hours a week for a year. Dedicated. No other mission in life other than to help move these great ideas uh, along, to help to coordinate uh, and co convene and collaborate, uh, and it'll uh, e uh, hopefully uh, trigger some uh, commitment making. I, I, I guess I'll end by saying I love PhDs. Uh, my wife's a PhD, but PhDs are equally uh, value. And so, Mr. Secretary, we hope along the line of your comments about doing something, that this helps us to do something and help the president to do something not just rely on him to uh, pass executive orders or laws based on our recommendations. So this commitment is real. It's effective March of this uh, month uh, to commemorate the Freedmen's Bank. Uh, it, you can do with it as you like. It's good for a year. And uh, I will end by saying that I'm making a commitment to sort of kick everything off. Uh, I'm going to fulfill a commitment and make one. I, last council meeting, I opened my big mouth and said I thought we should be showing up in communities. Uh, I mentioned one, Ferguson. Uh, I'm proud to tell you that uh, April of this year, uh, I guess in a month, we'll be opening a Hope Inside in Ferguson, sponsored by Regions Bank. I'd uh, like for council members to show up with me in Ferguson to cut the ribbon uh, or to whatever, talk to, to talk to young people about how to move their lives forward. But this is a, a full-time office uh, with full-time people helping people help themselves in Ferguson. Missouri with financial capability, financial literacy, EITC, hopefully my RIA, IRA, uh, and HUD certified services, and uh, a range of other um, supports. Thank you very much. So obviously we're glad to have this conversation continue, but we also wanted to hear from the um, the working group. So I, I think we just encourage people to continue this conversation. And obviously, Melissa, Louisa, and I are uh, glad to 
keep this conversation going and thank you to John and others for your commitments to work around this issue and hopefully we can bring it to reality. So uh, with that, why don't we turn to um, the committee chairs and if, if we could, why don't we start with Charlie Sharp for Visa. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, and, and thank you for the opportunity to chair the Innovation and Technology Working Group. Our group benefits from a wide range of perspectives and an abundance of imagination and expertise. Our mission is to identify, improve, and promote technologies that increase financial capabilities for youth. We decided as a group early on that the group would have the greatest impact if it served as a technology partner for the other three working groups. Therefore, our report focuses on the three ongoing work streams. First of all, technologies for enhancing the capability of K through 12 teachers. Second, online tools that help current and prospective university students maximize the value of their investments in higher education, and three, expanding access to high quality transaction accounts for financially underserved youth. In order to maximize the time for discussion, I will just briefly summarize these. First, let me start with K through 12 program. In December, our working group partnered with the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston to convene a symposium on education technology. We brought members of the council together with the founders of successful startups and applied their lessons to financial capabilities. A key takeaway was that if teachers understand finance, they will be better equipped to teach financial concepts to their students. We therefore recommend the development of a technology-based teacher training tool. The tool shall seek to provide incentives for teachers to build their own financial capability and their ability to integrate financial topics into the classroom. A staggering statistic that I learned was that 85% of these teachers believe that financial education is critically important with only 20% actually being comfortable themselves. Number two, higher education. The Innovation and Technology Working Group is working with the Higher Education Working Group to develop an online decision-making tool that combines data analytics and one-on-one -on -one mentoring to help students make better financial decisions, decisions about their post-secondary education. Specifically, we're looking at pilot projects that will consider the following topics selecting the right degree, saving for and financing post-secondary education, budgeting and making wise decisions while pursuing a degree, and choosing the right repayment plan. Cities and communities. Local governments have a key role, as we've heard today, to play in promoting financial capability, and Visa has been honored to partner with Treasurer Cisneros and the Cities and Communities Group in this work stream. San Francisco and other U.S. cities have programs, as you've heard, that combine summer work experiences with financial education. The challenge is that many of the young people employed by cities and communities are unbanked. Exclusion from the mainstream banking system means that these young people are forced to rely on, on expensive alternative <coughs> financial services, as we've heard today. Through the Council, we're looking at innovative solutions that will allow young Americans to have more and better choices. High quality transaction accounts exist in the marketplace today. Our challenge as a council is to encourage the adoption of these products by highlighting what works and focusing on the education of these products. In our report, we recommend that the federal government help cities expand financial access by encouraging the disbursement of wages electronically. We also call for the private sector partnership. We also call for the private sector partnership with state and local governments to design suitable and inclusive solutions. There are best practices out there. I'll conclude with a word of appreciation for the team at the U.S. Department of Treasury's Office of Consumer Policy. Their passion for financial inclusion and commitment to real-world impact is extraordinary, and on behalf of our group, I'd like to commend them for their service. Thank you. So in the interest of time, why don't we jump to the higher education group, and I'll call on Carol Quillen, and then we'll come back if we have time for more discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman and members of the Council, I want to first of all acknowledge the incredible talent and insight of the working group members with whom I've had the privilege of collaborating over these many months and just briefly summarize uh, where we are in our work right now. The post-secondary education group is focused on the relationship between financial capability, education, and autonomy. So the, our presumption is that in order to achieve a fully democratic society, a society in which people have the opportunity to achieve financial autonomy, um, we need to think across the areas of education, financial literacy and financial education, and work. 
And so our, 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 all of our work has focused on uniting those three areas. We've come to, after a convening yesterday where we spoke about education as an asset and, and thought about educational choices as asset building, we've come to sort of two conclusions, which may at this point sound kind of obvious to everyone here, but I think it's important to restate them. The first is that when you are trying to help people think through the relationship among savings, financial literacy, work, and education, cross-sector partnerships are crucial. It is through these cross-sector partnerships that we're able to link in the minds of our young people the activities of saving, going to school, and getting a job. And so the most successful programs that we've looked at link these three things. And I would defer to my council member, my co-council members, to describe programs where we know what works. And this works in workforce development, and it also works in decision making around post-secondary options. So the second thing that we've learned is that um, while information is great, information that is not trusted, timely, and relevant is not, does not change behavior. And so we focused a lot with respect to post-secondary decision making on how can we get students information that is trusted, timely, and relevant at the moment at which it will help them do something other than what they would have done without it. And so when we speak about the technology tool that we're looking at, it would be a tool that combines um, a kind of personalized approach to each student that therefore sifts through the massive information that we have available to us, delivers that information to a student, and combines it with mentoring. So it's complex, <coughs> but we really do believe that the problem with respect to post-secondary decision making is not a lack of information. We're awash in information. It's a lack of information that is delivered to the student in a timely way, trusted information that's relevant to what they're trying to decide at that moment. So going forward, we believe that we can build on the existing cross-sector partnerships that we learned about over the course of the last few months and also yesterday to, embed, to ensure that we are trying new programs that expose student, young people simultaneously to the act of saving, whether through uh, child savings accounts at K through 12 schools or through uh, summer internship programs that include uh, automatic deposit and a mechanism for saving. Uh, or through programs that combine work, financial literacy, and opportunity for an internship, or through programs that retrain workers who have been displaced from one program to another. All of these programs my fellow council members can speak about. So to build on existing partnerships to create programs that combine opportunities for young people to save, go to school, and get a job. Um, and I think with that, I'll stop talking. Thank you. Thank you, and let's turn to Mark Morial from the K through 12 uh, working group. Before yeah, very here. quickly in the interest of time, I wanna introduce my colleagues, Amy Rosen and Ted Beck, to talk about two initiatives. Amy, will go to you first and then Ted, in the teacher training area, which is a focus of the K through 12 working group. Amy? Um, sure, uh, and I think Charlie just um, alluded to this, because this is a This? You had it okay, uh, this is a um, idea is, a, is a, a partnership with the technology committee, and um, what we're interested in doing is using our power of convening um, to put together a group that, um, powered by digital technologies, um, can explore new ways of preparing pre-K through um, 14 teachers um, to master and teach financial literacy. This is not um, geared to teachers who are planning. Um, on teaching personal finance. You know, we, we know that there's a lot of content, a lot of curriculum out there, um, and much of it is very good that's addressing this, but it really goes to the 80% um, that, that we keep referring to of teachers who are uncomfortable with personal finance issues. And it's sort of a double win if we can take teachers who teach math, who teach English, who teach core subjects, and actually get them more comfortable with personal finance and test the notion that that will get them to use um, personal finance as exemplars in learning in the classroom. Um, and really address the concern that though, you know, many personal finance classes and offerings are quite strong, it's just random whether or not you're fortunate enough to be in a school at a grade that has that experience. Great, Ted? Great, thank you. Uh, in the spirit of making announcements, I will mm -hmm. stay with the theme. Uh, we are right now, NEFI, my organization, is working with the University of Arizona, their Take Charge America program. 
Uh, and we're in the process of building a online national teacher resource. Uh, Mr. Summers made a very good point earlier. When you talked about in Chicago, there's 137 programs. So if you're a teacher or an instructor, where do you start? And how do you assemble something that works for you? So the idea is, is we're building out, and it will be up and running for the new school year, a program where a teacher can come in and knowing what their class looks like, what their age group is, uh, and how much time they have, they can actually go in and assemble a course using a shopping cart kind of process that combines resources from different organizations that are tested and vetted and well regarded. So the teacher can then go in and find a simple way to do this. So phase one, we are building that out uh, and that will be up and running. Uh, and second, we are going to be adding other providers beyond NEFI and Take Charge America so that you can go in and find numerous resources and the best teachers out there mix and match resources. So this hopefully will make it easier to cut through that clutter that several people have talked about today. Uh, we also will link it to the, deliver, the uh, developing teacher training programs that are out there so that it's very clear that they have this access. And most importantly, the, it's a free resource. Uh, if you talk to teachers, and different programs out there, capital and resources is a huge issue. So we are building this, and it will be available to any teacher in the country this summer. Great. Thank you very much. And let me just say on behalf of the working group, uh, a thank you to Melissa and Louisa, and also the great members of our working group who've spent a lot of time, and Kyle Williams and others who've worked on this. And essentially, we're, we are about empowering the teacher, giving the teacher tools, knowledge, and capability. And this, I think, is consistent with so much of what the other working groups talked about. So thank you. Let, let me intervene just to reinforce that as well. And the statistic you gave earlier about the difference in the huge percentage of teachers who recognize the importance of this and the small percentage of teachers who have confidence in their ability to deliver it. Teacher training is what will fill the gap there. If it does, then we've also developed a huge constituency across every one of the 50 states to make sure that financial literacy is embedded in the classroom, that it actually occurs in the classroom, not just as a concept or a mandate, but actually uh, as a hands-on thing. And that, to me, will move the ball more than anything. I think teacher training becomes really critical to, to building this out. Great. So if you don't mind, we're going to take a moment uh, and recognize and hear a few words from Valerie Jarrett, who is Senior Advisor to the Husband. Thank you for joining us, Valerie. Uh, thank you, Melissa. Good morning. I think it's still morning. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, I just wanted to pop over and express uh, appreciation on behalf of the president for everything you're doing. Uh, we have all known John forever and his commitment and his passion for this issue has been a part of his life. But the fact that you, all of you join and share in that vision is so important to us and we're going to make a dramatic difference. Uh, it's interesting that you're here coincidentally on the day that the president and the first lady are, not, are launching a new initiative uh, called Let Girls Learn. And yes, and well, obviously Anna knows all about it. She'll be there. Uh, and it's a global initiative that's designed to make sure that the 62 million girls who currently are not in school, half of who are adolescents, <coughs> have the opportunity to go to school. And so as we're thinking about our efforts here in the United States, I want you to also think globally about the role that we can play leading by example. And part of, as we establish our initiative globally, we've got to figure out how included, included in that uh, financial literacy and financial stability. And so many of you who I know have global operations, we're going to be reaching out to you and thinking how we can take the very, very important work that we've done for young people here in the United States uh, far more broadly. So I hope no one's getting tired because we still have a lot of work to do. People joke, they often ask me, well, you know, how's the president feeling? It's been six years. And uh, as he says, uh, very important things happen in the fourth quarter. And you never know, right? Down to the last minute, as I guess you would know, Kurt, right now. So we are, um, 
We really encourage and hearten by your participation and just want you to keep that energy going. And um, we look forward to having you back again at your next meeting and congratulations on everything that you've done so far. And with that, I'm going to exit because I actually have to finish my remarks for our event coming up this afternoon. But again, thank you. Thank you, John, for your leadership and thank everyone for being here. Well, I want to. Um I want to thank Valerie for your leadership and the president's leadership, because without your support and how much you've uh, been behind us, we wouldn't have been able to get all the things done that we've been able to get done here in Washington and now around the country. And so it's been great to work with you and your team. And also, you've had such an influence on putting together this extraordinary group of council members. This yes. is a great group of people, and it wouldn't have happened without your leadership. Well, one of the cooler things that I get to do, as you all know, is to call many of you and encourage you to participate yes. in these efforts. And so for those of you who say yes, we appreciate it. And I have to also give a shout out. I know you heard from Jack Lou earlier. We started our day together. We talked about how important this is. And obviously, the support that we receive from the Department of Treasury is essential to making all of this work. So uh, thank you to, to Jack and everyone on his team as well, Melissa. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks. John, I'm going to take over the mic. Um, I know we wanted to make sure that we hear from all of our council members. I know we're coming up against the clock. I want to turn it to Jose and give a report out on the work of the your subcommittee. Sure, and I'll try and keep it brief. The cities and communities working groups, number one priority is to integrate financial capability practices for young Americans directly into the programs and services that are delivered by local governments and tribal governments. We've identified four core strategies. First, embed financial education and access to safe checking and savings accounts into all youth employment and training programs, as we've talked about so much today. Second, ensure every family has the opportunity to save for college by expanding access to child savings accounts and creating effective savings incentives. Third, we want to protect vulnerable youth, like those in our foster care, programs from identity theft and credit abuse. And fourth, leverage community hubs like libraries and community colleges to become central locations to deliver financial capability services. So to advance these priorities, we're working closely with the federal agencies to remove barriers that inhibit our progress on the local level, that allow funding to be used to support these efforts and disseminate proven models and best practices across the United States. We're, working, we're working closely with members of the council to provide the safest checking and savings accounts for young people. And we're working to develop a technology platform to more easily allow more communities to provide child savings programs like kindergarten to college. Um, we were going to have a couple of our uh, group members just say very quickly uh, some of the efforts they're working on. Rick Ketchum, FINRA is heading some important research to help move this work forward. Can you describe its relevance to the work of the council? Sure. Thank you, Jose. Uh, just very briefly, uh, at, in all of these things, it's critical to continue to track and measure progress and, and be, be clear where, where the greatest challenges are. So I just wanted to indicate that the FINRA Foundation is in the process of fielding the third wave of the National Financial Capability Study that I think all the members are, are familiar with beginning in June of this year, working closely with Treasury, CFPB, the Federal Reserve, and, and the federal agencies generally. Uh, the, while the core structure of the study will remain unchanged, key updates for 2015 will include the addition of questions on student loans, relevant to our discussion today, that will allow researchers to better understand the dynamics of student loan debt, Questions on medical costs will enable researchers to explore the relationship between medical debt and health care services, and demographic questions that will help researchers uh, to better understand specific populations, including <coughs> Native Americans, disabled Americans, and military veterans. Uh, the, the survey will be in the field from June through approximately September, uh, and we'll field a separate follow-up survey that digs more deeply into financial decisions of the more than 8,000 respondents who hold taxable investment accounts. So, thank, thank you. Thank Thank you so much, Rick. Carrie Doy, your organization is leveraging youth employment and training programs already. If these recommendations are adopted, can you talk about the impact it would have? Uh, yeah, yeah, and thank you for the question. It, you know, it, it, it is a real teachable moment when, when uh, a youth in, in a summer job uh, uh, realizes uh, that he has to work or she has to work for eight hours to, to be able to buy a, uh, a pair of Nike shoes. 
you know, yeah. these kinds of programs are, are absolutely essential, especially um, when it comes to uh, match <coughs> savings programs that helps to incentivize people. Um, as a result uh, of, these, uh, of these kinds of efforts, uh, 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 our uh, graduates of our programs have been able to to uh, save enough money, we've, we've been able to declare 100 percent success in that they've all gone on to college in, in some way or another and are paying for tuition and books and all of those kinds of things. And, and I have to emphasize that, that, that especially in today's climate with so much dis distrust in government, uh, that, that it's because of uh, being community-based organizations that's developed the trust of the communities uh, that we have that kind of impact. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Carrie. And finally, Dr. Stanback Stroud, uh, at Skyline Community College, you're now providing one-on-one -on -one financial counseling to your students every day. How can we work more effectively with community colleges to provide more resources to students in the United States? Thank you. Got it? Thank you, Jose, for that question. Uh, as a matter of fact, for so many Americans, community colleges do represent the, an important chance for upward mobility. And whether their students are studying for to gain a degree or to transfer to a university or to improve, improve a particular job skills, the, um, the community colleges make good on, it's important that community colleges make good on transform, the promise of transforming their lives. Um, but one of the biggest issues that you do find with students is uh, one of the biggest issues affecting student success, indeed, is poverty. And uh, so at Skyline College, we recognized that our students had very different needs. They were no longer just saying to us they couldn't afford their fees or they couldn't afford the calculator or the textbook. We actually had students presenting saying they were drinking hot water because they wanted to save the food for the children. So we realized that we had to reconceptualize the ways in which we thought about student services. Um, and we developed a Spark Point Center. And a Spark Point Center is a financial center. It's based on the Annie E. Casey model of uh, Centers for Working Families. And it has three major components, which is income building, uh, asset development, income and asset development, uh, career technical education, as well as financial literacy. The success that we have derives from a, a clear set of measurable outcomes uh, for our students around helping them manage debt, increase their income and savings, and improve their credit scores. And the results do improve their persistence and retention in the institution exponentially greater than the general student population. Uh, and we've worked with local partners such as the United Way of the Bay Area to, uh, to bring about that. So here are some very specific things that could happen to help us uh, do that. Because imagine to have an, uh, an infrastructure or a network of Sparkport centers across the nations because the community colleges across the nations have reconceptualized how they would deliver student services to incorporate this very important work. The government could support colleges in funding the technical assistance that's needed to get started uh, to adapt the existing models of their wraparound supports and integrate them into the existing student support services. On a federal level, the policies to provide services for financial literacy and to help move people into greater self-sufficiency could be better integrated. Right now, that burden of integration of those policies falls on the local provider. So you literally have sometimes a station where you can serve this person, but another person can't be served because that was DOL money, and this was higher ed money, and this was um, the farm bill, and so therefore you can't go there, but you can go here. And the local providers uh, are really struggling with that. Uh, I do believe there's good news because of the possibility of spark points being incorporated and in, in building upon our existing investment. Um, so incentives that support an infrastructure that would help the colleges quickly develop the capacity, cultivate the partnerships, and facilitate the connections of individuals to, ben uh, to benefits uh, which they're eligible but do not necessarily access would be great. I do believe that spark point centers or these types of centers have a similar capability of similar capability could be integrated into the fabric of these institutions. So at my institution is a part of the facilities master plan, the ed plan, the governance thing. It's in every single aspect of the institution, so it's not a program on the side. And that's a matter of leveraging it, uh, for an example, and then bringing it to scale so it has a large impact. Yes, I do believe that these strategies are designed to increase the physical, the uh, fiscal capabilities of Americans who are focused on upward mobility could be incorporated in 
the typical operations of community colleges across the nation. Integrating these strategies is consistent with and connected to the many community college mission statements across the nation. And it's related to that, that are particularly related to life transformation and upward mobility and preparation for full civic engagement and participation in and contribution to society at large. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Stanback Stroud. And, and I know we're mindful of time, and I just want to thank you for the opportunity to show the exciting opportunities I believe we have um, at, at, in the city and communities um, landscape to take some very, very exciting and real life-changing programs to success. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Um, so we did not hear from everybody. We've got that in mind. Um, we will have one additional council meeting before the council concludes. Uh, I think it's clear to all of us there's a lot of great work happening. Part of what we're going to be doing, in part with John Hope Bryant's resources that he's bringing to bear, is nice. really finding the coalescing around these different initiatives and sort of how are we making this work of the council. Uh, so thank you all. Really appreciate your time and effort. And uh, John, you want to close us out? Well, thank you. I wanted to also thank everybody. We've clearly been working really hard. The subcommittees have worked very, very hard, accomplished a lot. It's been great teamwork among all the different council members. So again, we really appreciate that. I also want to give a special shout out to John Oxtoby, who has worked extraordinarily hard on our team and full time on this, taking over for our part time friend, Bob Solomon from the last council. So uh, we really appreciate your efforts, John, in helping pull all this together. So with that, we'll call the meeting and, and have an adjournment. Thank you. <laughs>